welcome back to the old steam powered machine shop. I'm Dave. This is video number 48. Uh, and on this channel, we try to uh, recreate and preserve a little bit about our industrial heritage. Uh, there's a lot of other channels that are doing the same thing. We've got some guys that are resurrecting old machinery left and right. And, uh, uh, if you dig around, you'll find it. Uh, but this is sort of an ongoing thing here, and if you're new to this channel, uh, you might want to uh, go back and look at some of the older videos. They're all up there. Uh, uh, had some viewers uh, this last time uh, comment that they would like to see a little bit more on uh, the steam engines themselves. I mean, if it's somebody that, if you're someone who's really interested in steam power or you want to build a model steam engine and you just want to know a little bit more about it, I'll, uh, I kind of explain this in video number three and a half uh, that I made about, geez, about three years ago, I guess it was, uh, on the old, little smaller O&S engine that I used to run the whole shop with. And uh, uh, let's see, Tom was here for a while. Uh, he hasn't been around the shop much because he has a new, uh, really cute little granddaughter that he is spending a lot of time with. And uh, so uh, if I get him over here once in a while, that's about as good as we can expect these days. Uh, but Tom helped me with some loose ends and uh, we, we got, the, uh, got the rings for the Morris engine finished up. And uh, I want to, uh, on each video from now on, I want to kind of go back and revisit some of the things about my power plant here in the shop. And uh, on this one, I'm going to show you a little bit about my boiler that I'm using here and how it's constructed and the maintenance of it. Um, one other thing I'd mention is there is one piece of equipment that I always I uh, wanted to have in this shop, uh, and that's a planer. Uh, most old machine shops had a planer back in the corner somewhere for doing, uh, you know, big flat cuts on bigger jobs. They are quite big. Uh, I got track of one this summer that I was really interested in, but boy, the thing was just too big. It had a, it had a ten and a half foot long table on it, and you got to figure. You know, the table reciprocates back and forth across the machine, so it sticks out the ends. So if it's got a 10-foot table, you're going to need eh, 15, 18 feet at least of room. And uh, uh, it's just too big. And so if I could find one with a table on it about maybe 5 foot long, four and a half, five 5 foot, and maybe some of you viewers might know where... There is one kicking around somewhere in the northeast, hopefully, uh, that could be gotten. Uh, a belt drive, uh, uh, belt, uh, rack and pinion drive, uh, early 1900s would be preferable. Um, so that's the news from Lake Wobegon. We'll uh, get right into the machine work and the boiler. Thanks for watching. I brushed out the flues and cleaned off the top of the boiler here. Uh, try to brush the flues at least once a month, but sometimes you don't get around to it. And this was getting really sooted up and it was starting to fire really hard. I was using the engine quite a lot uh, yesterday and uh, I had to fire the boiler really hard to even get keep 40 PSI on it. So. I knew it was getting pretty dusty in here. So that's done. And I want to show you a little bit about uh, how these boilers were made. Now this is a 1924 Monday steam hoist boiler. Uh, it's about an 18 horsepower boiler. It's got 64 flues. Uh, they're two inch and two inch was the standard of the industry, so to speak, on the old style boilers. Uh, this is called a, a fire tube boiler, and 
the verticals and the horizontals are it's all the same deal it's just that the vertical is standing upright and the reason for that is it takes up less floor space and they were more common indoors and the horizontal ones of course are like a locomotive boiler and the flues run horizontally but the principle is the same the fire is in the bottom and the heat comes up through the flues and it's surrounded by water uh, and uh, it generates the steam. There's also another type boiler called a, uh, a water tube boiler and that's just the opposite. It has a series of tubes that are slanted upwards slightly and uh, they're full of water and the fire is around the outside and then it has a, uh, a tank on the top and the bottom they were considered to be more efficient and cheaper to build real big ones and they were used in a lot of industry um, but getting back to the fire tube boiler here uh, <clears throat> these flues uh, are seamless steel they're about uh, I think about a hundred and twenty thousandths thick I'm not positive on that but they're put through the bottom flue head and this top flue head in a very snug fit with about a sixteenth of an inch sticking out and then this type of device is called a flue roller and it's got roller bearing uh, rollers here that are uh, captured in this like a like a roller bearing would be and then it's got a tapered pin here made out of hardened steel and you put that inside the flue and turn it and this taper pin forces the rollers out and you can see it's a very laborious job to roll those in and tighten them up in the hole uh, they usually like Shops usually had uh, a socket on here where they could spin it with an air wrench or an air pneumatic driver of some type and then later electricity. But that rolls the flue tight in the flue chute. You can see it's got these stops here that go against the flue head. When you're using the roller this bead wouldn't be here yet. So these would be these stops would be down against the flue head, and as you turn it, the rollers swedge the flue out tight against the hole. So then you still got a sixteenth of an inch sticking out on it, and you have to bead those flues over and that's very beautifully done on this boiler. I almost believe these are the original flues. I, I, I have no way of knowing but that's done with a tool like this. Uh, it's called a beading tool. I, I actually bought this from a retired boiler maker that I met and this one is designed to work with an air hammer of course but you can do it by hand. But the idea is, you would put this in there at about a 45 degree angle this way and about a, maybe a 30 degree angle that way, which is just a feel thing, years of experience. And this notch starts to roll the bead over. And he told me he never went around less than three times. And when you get done, you'll end up with a bead roughly shaped like that curve in there. Also the beads give the boiler a lot of strength this way because they're all you know holding the ends of the boiler together. Then another thing that was done I'm kind of in my own light here was uh, caulking. After these boilers were riveted together uh, they were caulked. I had some questions on how did they seal them, which is an amazing thing to me, but they did. And they used a kind of a blunt chisel like this 
and it would come over here at the right angle just about in the middle of this uh, sheet or uh, the boiler shell and go around it and you can see on this there is a, a recessed area in here and what that does is and you hold it just right it expands the edge of the material into intimate contact with this which is very carefully very carefully pressed in a lip comes way down here below the rivets and uh, it's called caulking and it led to some problems with boilers in the early days because they were doing it on the inside too and they were doing it wrong and they were leaving marks uh, they were digging into the uh, the one piece uh, the outside piece when, when they were caulking and it was that sharp V that scratch in there was creating corrosion uh, it, it encouraged corrosion in there and it also was a stress concentration point and they had some boiler failures because of that so the National Board Code from then on uh, stated that you could no longer caulk a boiler from the inside. It all had to be from the outside where you could see it. Uh, so anyway, uh, of course the bonnet fits on here and there's a uh, hooks up to this linkage there's a butterfly valve in there to, call the, to control the draft on the top. Uh, over there is the uh, the relief valve uh, which is set for 70 psi on this I just recently had this boiler inspected by New York State and they gave me uh, 10 more psi pressure than what I had been carrying so that's a that's a new valve This is one of the original rings <clears throat> and the split on the ring is 45 degrees approximately. So that's what I'm going to make a 45 degree cut through this ring here on the milling machine. Uh, I set it up in this old, old angle plate, which I really like this thing. It's something my dad had for years and years and years. and down here in really old font is some lettering about something about a piston and a bin number and all this and, I, and I'm pretty sure this came from the uh, Lehigh Valley Railroad shop in Sarah, Pennsylvania and uh, when they quit building that locomotive or whatever they, uh, that class of locomotive they scrapped them so a friend of my dad's lugged it home and uh, I've remachined one side of it and it was pretty straight so I've been using it for a uh, angle plate and this is square here with the bottom <clears throat> the top is square with the bottom this side over here is a little off so I'm, go I'm going by this side here when I use it so what I did is I clamped the ring in here and uh, the problem is to find the center problem is to find the center of this arc or the center of the ring so that you can get the split right on top so uh, I just laid off I scribed the line here and scribed the line here and then uh, bisected them with dividers so it's the same and scribed the line there
I got the ring clamped in my <clears throat> little turning device here. Uh, it's actually a faceplate, and this is the ring, and this is part of uh, a jig that I made for a smaller set of rings uh, on the O&S Mill engine. And <clears throat> that was actually the back plate for that, and I'm using it for the front plate here. There's a threaded rod all the way through and a nut back here clamping it together. This is the end of a car axle <clears throat> that I machined flat on the front and used it before uh, turned around to act like a faceplate uh, when I was making a set of rings for the smaller engine. But now I'm using it as a clamp plate with a rod through here. The ring gap is right there and I uh, clamped it together with a clamp and then uh, just tapped it and lined it up and I got it within about 20 thousandths and that's about as good as you're going to do because it's not round now because it's been uh, clamped, it's been sprung to close up the gap here. So now the plan is to carefully turn the OD of the ring to the exact OD of the cylinder. Pretty light cut segments. And I got it down at a pretty low speed too. Uh, six inch of diameter will kind of fake you out. Uh, that's a lot of surface speed, a lot of surface feet per minute. If you get up uh, much above 200 uh, feet per minute with a uh, high-speed steel tool bit, uh, the point will be gone in no time. got the ring in it pre-jaw cut very carefully with a very light cut getting the inside diameter of the ring round. The ring is compressed in the chuck. I've got the ends butted together right out of jaw. Well, ready to put these on. I've already test fitted them in the cylinder. 
and uh, file the gaps to 15 thousandths. Uh, I've made a corporate decision here. That's one of the great things about being in business for yourself. You don't have to confer with anybody. i am decided to leave this expander out. <clears throat> I think it's more trouble than it's worth. So, I'm going to install these rings and they go on side by side. Like so. And this plate goes on here in the correct position. You won't get it just right, you won't get the bolts in. Uh, the interesting thing is a lot of bigger stationary engines too are made this way so that you can you can actually pull this they call it a follower which is the top half and the land ring land of the piston off and pull the rings out and replace them without taking even the piston out of the cylinder Five thousand side clearance between the rings and between the rings and the lands. <clears throat> I'm going to tighten these up and uh, uh, take a look at what has to be done on the cylinder yet.
little spanner. I've been working on this for about two and a half days. Took it completely apart, put it together with all the right bolts, the right hardware, checked the clearances, adjusted everything, got the valve adjusted, uh, all the fittings tightened up, and uh, here we are at the end of a long road. About two and a half years messing with this, and uh, you regular uh, viewers, that have followed this since the beginning, this is for you. We got her hooked up to compress there. We got very little air volume, but it runs pretty good. Yeah. belt wants to ride up on that edge of that for some reason. 